IT real estate person. Uh, and hi, Emery. Uh, and uh, I did speak with uh, uh, Patty uh, earlier this week. Uh, she had originally planned to join us today, but she has a conflicting meeting. Uh, Patty uh, manages uh, real estate uh, for a large region of m and uh, and she's based in Buffalo. Uh, so she uh, was unable, unable to join us today, but she has been here, met with Charlie uh, and I uh, back in the winter uh, and walked the property. And we had uh, basically come up with an, a lease agreement that was uh, being worked through and talked about. And it involves basically not only an agreement between the city and m and but also does involve uh, the Hotel Rodney, because as I think all of you will recall, the Hotel Rodney has had the use of spaces in that lot in the, uh, on, for several years. And the, this uh, reconfiguration of the parking lot would require a change in that relationship. So uh, we can talk about those details, but I think Charlie, if you, do you have your, your uh, if you wanna share the screen? There you go, good, you're way ahead of me. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. So welcome now. I'll turn it over to Charlie, and why don't you yep. go from there, Charlie? Hello, everyone. Good morning. Morning. Um, so you will recall that we were working on the M&T park, parking lot with the idea of um, creating significantly more spaces inside that lot. Right now, the aisleway is so wide that by narrowing the, the aisleway, we can create um, quite a number of of new spaces. We actually, <clears throat> the final concept, which everybody on the committee that was on the committee before will remember, we went through several iterations. The final concept that we took to contractors to get pricing on um, is the one that I'm showing you right now that um, creates 39 parking spaces. Right now there's 26 out there. So we're picking up 13 spaces. Um, so that's, pretty significant number of spaces that we're picking up in that small physical space. Um, so I just wanted to just give you a brief, um, you know, update on where, where this design was. Um, the way it works out, the way we've talked about it with the bank is that there's 19 M&T um, dedicated spaces, um, pardon me, 17 dedicated spaces for um, M&T Bank plus one dedicated ADA space for the bank. Um, and then there's four spaces we have dedicated to the Hotel Rodney and you can see them um, right up here. The bank spaces are up towards the bank. Here's their bank ADA space. And then the city has uh, 16 dedicated spaces on the third street side with um, an ADA space up here as well for, for city use. Um, also, and Ted can talk about this better than me, but this, these bank dedicated spaces will be available for city use in non-banking hours, um, which is, you know, sometime, I guess, after three or four o'clock in the afternoon and then on the certain times of the weekend as well. Um, as part of this design, we had to reconfigure the dumpster. You can sort of see the way the dumpster is shadowed in the background right now. Um, but if we were to leave that, you can see it would take by the, the trash trucks coming in this way to access where it is now it would take out four or five spaces. So we reconfigured it and they'd be able to access it from Market Street. Uh, we've done the turning analysis in and out. It's a little odd in that they got to pull in. That part of it's not too bad, but then back out on the market street. We think we can work that out um, just based on them being careful and also the time of the day when they come in. In terms of ingress and egress, um, the way into the new parking lot would be up by the Hotel Rodney and you can negotiate your way all the way around into this aisle way and park on either side or go right back out this way. And you can still go back out this way as well. Um, I should say you can come in this entrance too. So there's two ways into the parking lot. Um, we're trying to reuse existing parking bumpers that are there just in the interest of cost efficiency. Um, and there's certain places along the way where we have those kind of flexible 
uh, plastic um, delineator posts to sort of, you know, guide traffic so they're not having any interest in getting into this parking space or getting into this parking space and this one down here. So that's all part of it. Um, that's sort of a, you know, really real summary of the design. We did put it out for bid though. Um, and we got proposals back from two different contractors, Jerry's um, Inc, Jerry's Paving and Teal Construction. Um, and the prices came in a little bit above our estimate, but not too bad. You know, just in summary, I'm going to say that it, it was a strange one because, you know, you had to come up with an estimate for the total project, but you also had to estimate the three different parts of it, the city's portion, m and portion, and the Hotel Rodney portion. And um, it worked out well on the bids for the city and m and I, Ted, I guess I'd say, but a little high on the, on the Hotel Rodney side. So that, that's going to be something that we need to work our way through. The low bid that we received um, was from Jerry's in the amount of $65,137 um, for all this work. We did have a deduct um, that would, instead of making all this curb around these landscape islands concrete, it would be timber. Um, and if you, if we were to go with the timber, um, there was like a $5,500 deduct on the Jerry's one. The problem with it is, is that, like I said before, the city's portion is like 20% of that. The m and portion is 16% of that. And then the, the rest of it, 66% of it kind of sort of fell on, um, on the Hotel Rod. It's, it's a significant number for them. Could we, uh, um, on that note, I months and months ago ran into Chris Becker about the impact or, to the, her, their business which i mean just philosophically if this is a change to help all the businesses the city um what what should the impact be to a personal business uh particularly in light of covid um i can only assume she's not having a great year uh, i'm just asking the sort of question it, to the group. I, it's a good question um I would say that what you have to look at is uh, the fact that uh, you know, Hotel Rodney has had open utilization of the dumpster space uh, and six parking spaces for uh, many, many years, uh, predates M&T's ownership um, and without any fee. Uh, that parking arrangement, I understand from Patty Door, was canceled this spring. Uh, they sent a letter to the owner of the Hotel Rodney canceling the park the reserved parking spaces although because we didn't proceed they've continued to use them um, the repositioning of the dumpsters really enables us to uh, get the maximum number of spaces as charlie indicated um, and uh, the really the, the structural re rearrangement of the dumpsters uh, the dumpsters as i understand it only uh, only serve the hotel rodney i had invited jim o'hare who's uh the principal partner of Hotel Rodney to participate this morning. And I believe he, he said he was going to participate, but I don't know that he's here. Uh, and if so, if he is, I would certainly elevate him. But I do see Kathy Burrell is on the line and she is the manager of the property. Uh, and um, certainly Kathy could speak if she wants to. Uh, but the spaces, uh, the idea was to, that everyone would share. The bank was willing, and Charlie, you might want to be a little, speak a little bit more to what, the, what portions of it, uh, of the reconfiguration the bank was going to pick up and what mm -hmm. portions the city was going to pick up. Yeah. Um, the M&T portion was the, um, pretty much all the seal coating, because we're not, we're not rebuilding this paving, because it's in good condition, but we are going to seal coat it and restripe it, and they were that's the biggest part of what they were responsible for. 
all the all the pavement work, all the seal coating work, and then the parking bumpers, you know, setting up the spaces. And then um, the city had some work on a land, this landscape island down here, um, some of the concrete curbing and some of the bollards as well. And then, as you mentioned, Ted, Hotel Rodney was responsible for the, re the reconfiguration of the dumpster. Um, and that's the biggest part of why um, their part of it is a, a little bit higher is because it's just some relatively significant work to do that. And what Charlie didn't mention in terms of the city's cost would be, we would also need to um, add a, a pay station, which is roughly $8,000 uh, up, upfront cost to the city in terms of creating a station meter. So that would add significantly to the city's portion or contribution to this. Um, the Charlie mentioned that the city would have utilization or the ability to use the M&T spaces when the bank is closed. Uh, and so that would basically be evening hours, Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and M&T has a longstanding relationship with the uh, St. Peter's Church for their art uh, show the first Saturday in July. And uh, they wanted to make sure that we were aware and honored uh, that commitment that they have with St. Peter's. Uh, so that was one of the conditions of the lease that was going forward. Uh, I, when I spoke with Patty, she wanted to review the arrangement uh, of the, the whole thing. And uh, she indicated yesterday in an email that she had hoped to participate, but due to a conflict, she could not. Uh, so this is where we are right now. Uh, I'm sorry that uh, the Hotel Rodney uh, owner or principal owner of Jim O'Hare is not with us this morning. He does have this, he has seen it um, and um, has uh, reacted to, to it being uh, an expensive uh, change. Uh, one of the other things that added to the cost was in that green space that Charlie has designed around the Dempsters, there are two large hollies in there um, that have that predate anybody's utilization of this lot, uh, certainly predate M&Ts. And the bank was interested in maintaining those trees, which do soften that parking lot significantly from the street. Uh, and so we worked, Charlie had to work that design around those holly. Uh, so that added, perhaps it could have been a little tighter. Um, the other thing that drives this uh, cost for the bank, for the uh, Hotel Rodney is that um, the floor of the dumpster pen uh, would have a concrete floor, which would make it more durable. Uh, and uh, there, because of the reconfiguration, there is some pavement that would have to be replaced uh, about, um, Charlie, thank you for moving your cursor around, uh, showing that would have to be re, uh, re-established. So there's, there's a, a patching that needs to be done there. Mayor. Yes. Um, I, I've just unmuted Kathy Burl. There's, um, and, and that way she'll be able to talk. But okay, she, great. Thank you. He had put something in the Q and A that says that the hotel dumpster is used by M and T at no charge. Also, Rose and Crown Jewelry Store, Second Street Boutique, and Exhale Sap. Okay, I, I that's news to me. Okay. But, well, but, but I think that with for clar clarification, I don't think the the intention is the idea that the Hotel Rodney the business would be responsible. It would be the property owner. Right. The property owner is the same property owner that the Rose and Crown and the jewelry store, all of those are within that same um, property. So yep, exactly. the intent mm -hmm. is not that it would be the business. The intent Correct. is that it would be the, the property owner that would pay, but I, I've also unmuted her. So if she has anything to add. That's very helpful information, Kathy. If you want to speak, uh, you please do. Well, that, uh, that adds an interesting dimension. Uh, I think we need to get back with uh, Mr. O'Hare and, and work through that because uh, it, spreading that cost out over more businesses, uh, um, that's, that's helpful information. And what, also, <clears throat> what is the nominal amount of the impact to them, to the, the property owner or business? Charlie, did you, you have a number? Are you talking about what the, proposal cost came in for Hotel Rodney's portion? Yes, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, just on the base bid with the concrete curb, it was $41,000. It was, it was interesting because the teal bid was actually a little bit more cost effective on the Hotel Rodney property side. Um, like it was only 34,000, but they were higher on the M&T and city side and they were higher overall. So I got two different prices in the lowest ones from Jerry's, but it happens to be the highest one for the, uh, Hotel Rodney property. But to answer your question, Derek, it's like $41,000. And what proportion is that? Isn't, didn't you say 60% of the total cost of the project or? Did I get that yeah. wrong, Charlie? Yeah, roughly 60%, yeah. Yep. And how much of the 40-some thousand is related to the beautification green area? Because I don't believe that green area, which I love, by the way, for the aesthetics, is there now, correct? No, it's there. Oh, it is there? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just a little reconfigured. And there's not a whole lot of beautification included in this. It's just okay. preparing for somebody else to landscape basically. Oh, gotcha. Uh, the two holly trees are in the larger green area and they kind of, they would kind of overshadow the dumpster um, pen that would have to be built and they currently overshadow the, the one that's there. I, I had two, two questions. One is, um, I want to understand when people are paying for parking and would the M&T parking spaces uh, in off bank hours, are hours when when we have paid parking uh, would they be paid parking during those hours no they would the m and t would they the, they would have they would have signage on each of the spaces that would identify them for m and t employees and customers only and they would not be monitored during m and t banking hours uh, and they they would uh, they would however be monitored during non banking hours so basically from four to eight in the evening and then from um, from normal business normal uh, parking meter hours on saturday and sunday mm -hmm. or during bank holidays so uh, on a bank holiday all of those spaces would be paid uh you'd need to pay to park in them right exactly except for the hotel rodney ones exactly uh, yeah. 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 they would be each of there's going to have to be very specific signage that's one of the things that's uh, built into this estimate is getting the signage right, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that, so that, uh, and so there's that. Um, Mayor, along with that, is there a revenue sharing scheme? Like does M&T get a portion of the parking revenue that comes in in the off hours? Does hotel, like, or is it all like to the city? There is a revenue sharing uh, proposal uh, that was negotiated uh, way down. Uh, first year was uh, without, and then after that, there was a portion. And I want to tell you up front that this is a, a, a proposal that uh, if we would to go forward with this, uh, it's a two year lease. They wanted to try this rather than commit to a long term. And we went back and forth on that for quite a period of time and asking for three or five years. And they, they were adamant about wanting to stay with a two year trial. Um, and they've been very, they've been very cooperative uh, and worked very well, I think, with Charlie, their, their, uh, their uh, architect or engineer that were views plans, I think, provided you some feedback. Didn't Amy get back to you? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We had a couple iterations. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <laughs> but this is a two-year trial. Um, and uh, so that's, that's where it comes down as the, the income. I want to remind everybody that we're talking about a parking season that starts in May and ends on the 15th of October. So during the rest of the year, um, m and uh, employees could, could use basically any space without being charged. And so could Hotel Rodney's employees uh, or others uh, or their guests uh, use any of the spaces without being charged. Uh, so we're talking about just during the meter season that this would be in effect. I, I want to understand the, the, the dumpster. Um, so has, has the Hotel Rodney uh, had some kind of a lease agreement to have their dumpster located there? It was, a, as I understand it, it was a handshake that was done with, M with uh, Wilmington Trust. Mm -hmm. Okay. As a, we, I, we've never been able to identify a formal agreement. I think on the face of us, uh, on the face of it, 
we we're all, we probably are all a little surprised at the expense to of the uh, yeah. to the lease owner of uh, to the owner of of uh, the hotel Rodney building, mm -hmm. um, and uh, the dumpster being moved is being moved in a sense uh, forced upon them to create these additional parking spaces. Um, now, obviously, I think they're getting a benefit broader than the, their assigned parking spaces because it gives uh, uh, available parking and off hours for, uh, for lots of people. Right. And, you know, as I understand it, uh, the arrangement up until right now uh, has been at a no charge. There's been no fee paid by uh, the owner of the, of the build of the Hotel Rodney building or any other building or any other business that's using the dumpster. It's just been a, a courtesy. Um, mm -hmm. We have these kinds of arrangements elsewhere. Uh, if you look behind uh, Agave, there is a series of dumpsters there that are utilized by several businesses. Um, so those kinds of arrangements do exist. Uh, I don't know what Citizens Banks does when, when they allow their, uh, I don't know what that relationship is, but uh, that is something. But this is obviously a, a relationship that's old in that it's probably 20 years old. Um, I just had one last question, and that is in terms of uh, moving, uh, you know, potentially moving ahead with this, um, would all three parties need to agree to these costs? I mean, how, how, I'm trying to understand how one reaches agreement on the, uh, you know, from all three parties to, to actually do this. Well, I think uh, the bank owns the lot and the city is interested in the lease. Uh, there is no formal relationship with the Hotel Rodney. And I, I don't know what the bank is planning on doing in terms of formalizing the relationship with, with the owner of the Hotel Rodney. Uh, that's, but they have, uh, they have basically, uh, in speaking with uh, Patty Dorr, um, they have notified um, the owner that they would be canceling their relationship with the six spaces they currently have effective this past spring and that uh, going forward they would have four spaces at no charge okay that, i do not have a copy of that notification but that's what i've been told i i think that uh the other thing to consider is wh whether if the lease was two years or ten years the we're talking about a 13 spot net gain after the development mm -hmm. and I, we kind of talked about this, you know, in the past, it just seems like a, a pretty big commitment from all three parties, especially the city to get a net gain of 13 spots. And I think everybody on this committee and the public knows that our parking issue is a much bigger problem than getting 13, 13 new spots. And then if I was thinking about it this morning, because I wanted to ask the question with, with the 13 new spots gained, in theory, a portion of those are dedicated to the, to the bank's use during banking hours. So really how much are we gaining? It's actually less than 13 spots because during the daytime, they're gonna be, they're gonna be set aside for the bank and we're not gonna be able to utilize those until after five o'clock. So, I mean, you could argue that it's like, 10.2 spots, you know, not, not 13 from a time perspective on when it's available to the public. It just, I'd like to hear everybody else's feedback because at the, it seems like a significant project that, uh, you know, isn't giving us a lot of benefit in the long run. But I'm also concerned about the length of the lease. I know you already addressed it, but for, if, if the outlay is 70 grand and then you're really only using it for as to your point six eight months then it seems risky okay uh i would say matt in terms of i get we got your numbers but i think in terms of revenue for the city and available dedicated spaces for the city because right now all of those spaces on the m t lot are dedicated to m t uh except the six that the hotel rodney uses so in terms of uh, city gaining actual spaces for uh, customers that might come to all of downtown, the, the actual number is larger than what the 13 you're mentioning. Uh, because you know, we're picking up initially 
the, the, all the spaces that front on Third Street, which are 16, uh, and then the space, uh, the ADA space as well. So we're picking up a net gain of 17 dedicated parking spaces for the entire uh, business district, rather than all of those 26 spaces now uh, being dedicated to m and or Hotel Rodney. Ted, okay. who, mon who monitors those spaces during the day? I, uh, the bank does monitor now, uh, and uh, we would pick up the monitoring of our spaces if we, if we were to go forward with this. Mayor, um, there was a question that came across on the chat that's somewhat related to that, which is um, who would be responsible for the maintenance on the parking lot going forward and like plowing and stuff if, we, if there's a lease on it, for example? I believe the, uh, the bank retained that responsibility. Mayor, there's also a, a question in the Q&A on how much revenue per parking space does the city collect each year? And I'm gonna unmute Ellen Maureen because... Well, at the current rate, uh, at a dollar an hour, you've got, uh, you've got 17 spaces. Uh, you know, if you figured 100%, uh, we're at, uh, you know, we're at the, hour, the hourly rate. Uh, it's pretty easy to come up with a number if you figured 100% occupancy. I think what we did was a figure of 50% occupancy uh, when talking about this. But Ellen Lorraine may want to comment further. Ellen Lorraine, are you there? She might be away from her desk. Okay. Maybe, um... Well, it's 11 hours essentially, of, so $11 a day. So you're talking about roughly five to six dollars a day per space is what we what we used uh, as an estimate of revenue from the from thus those spaces that yeah. would be knew, dedicated to the city I and then on the weekends you'd have to factor in another number because of the potential of using the bank spaces i know we had figured out the full math and what the payback was mm -hmm. and i think I think we determined that it's going to take every bit of the two years to. It would take two years to pay for it. Yes. Right. But but you're saying that in two years, uh, with the parking fees to pay these portion. Yes, including the purchase of the meter, which was not in Charlie's estimate. Wow. Yeah. Uh, just a comment on thirteen spaces. I mean, thir uh, you know, I, I understand. Uh, you know, I agree with you, Matt, that that thirteen. Uh, can seem like a, a drop in the bucket, but if we're looking at the number of spaces there at 26, in a sense, it's a 50% increase in, in the number of spaces there. And at, at this point, it isn't as if we have a lot of city uh, spaces. I, mean, I know we're going to be talking about Schley later. Uh, we don't have a ton of options in terms of uh, identifying areas to get more parking spaces. Just to back up a bit, so everybody's on the same page, I think uh, when we first started down this path, we had a conversation about merging the city lot, which is immediately adjacent to this lot, to the right on your screen. And we looked at that as a possibility. It would have, while it would have generated more spaces, there is a grade differential uh, between uh, the M&T lot and where Charlie's drawing his, drawing his little hand up and down. Uh, and that, when we started looking at that, it's pretty significant grade differential, like 10 inches, that starts up at the backs of the buildings, tapers to nothing, but by the time it gets to uh, Third Street, but dealing with the, the grade differential, you would have had to take up all the tarmac and re reconfigure, uh, regrade the whole, the two lots in order to get them to merge. So we, this is how we came back to this, was still leaving the existing 19 space lot alone, and then uh, this one being the added space. Yeah, and that was definitely a case where you were only gonna pick up another space or two, but the price of the project was gonna go up for, you know, 35, 40,000. So it was, that definitely, there wasn't cost benefit with that. Uh, is it uh, the original before the changes? Does Rod Hotel Rodney, did I hear this right? 
currently has six spaces, but then after the reconfig, they have two? They have four. So they, they're going from six to four. Mm -hmm. Okay. I would just have a comment that I think until we get all the stakeholders on the call, meaning M and T, and then obviously Rod Hotel Rodney ownership has quite a stake in this as well. I don't know. I think right now we're just talking theoretically. Um, I think I think we are talking theoretically. Uh, there was considerable amount of discussion with uh, Larry Pfeiffer, who is uh, the Hotel Rodney's uh, legal. Uh, consultant uh, during and they've been furnished this uh, their objection was that, that I heard from uh, from Larry Pfeiffer was the concern about the cost uh, and uh, the information that Kathy Burrell shared uh, about share uh, about the, the use of the dumpster being shared uh, does shed a different light so and I'm sorry Jim uh, was not able to join us today because I think he could have uh, you know uh, he could have shed some more light on it. Uh, so we can continue this discussion. I think what we wanted to do is make sure everybody was on the same page with uh, where we are with this. Uh, we can go back to uh, Mr. O'Hare and, and Larry Pfeiffer uh, and figure out uh, where we go and, and report back to the committee. Uh, I, have, I have gone uh, back and forth with the bank several times. There is no movement on expanding the lease to more than two years. I can assure you of that. Um, uh, so, at least as a trial, and I asked for uh, the uh, automatic renewal, and that was declined as well. Was there a proposal on if they're happy after the two years, how long would they be willing to look at after that? They won't discuss it until they get closer to the end of the two years. Would it be possible to get um, figures on, I understand that, in, I think Emery said, that there's a two-year payback to this project yep. to the city mm -hmm. would it be possible to get a model run um of if the city picked up an additional uh maybe 25 percent portion or 50 percent portion and then a hundred percent portion of the hotel Rod rodney cost what the payback would be or how many additional months it would take to pay the project cost back we can certainly run a model like that. Yeah. I mean, just back of the envelope, it would seem that if the city's currently picking up 20% and it's a two year payback, if they were to assume, I'm not saying, I'm not proposing one do this, but if they were to assume the 66% that the Hotel Rodney has, it would, on a very approximate basis, it would be like six and a half, uh, something between six and seven years. Yeah. I would caution you to all of this would be theoretical because we based it on a 50% occupancy. Uh, you know, so it, you may get more than a 50% occupancy. Um, so what is uh, our average occupancy with our existing meters in town? I don't know. I, that I don't have an answer for. That'd be helpful to understand we how to accurate that 50% might be. We look, we need to look at it in terms of uh, 2019 rather yep. than this year. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> definitely. And, and I just realized I misspoke because Hotel Rodney only has four spaces right now and the city has 16 spaces for their, for their costs. So it would be much longer. So, well, you can run some models, yeah. uh, but you know, we can continue, we can also continue the discussion with uh, Mr. O'Hare and, and Larry Pfeiffer and see where we go. And we can get the um, current average capacity in 2019 for downtown meter, or not capacity, excuse me, I, usage. Yes, the, uh, Ellis, or excuse me, uh, Ellen Lorraine does uh, have um, revenue broken down by what kind of revenues we get. And then we could do that against available hours and see what, what percentage occupancy we come up with. I think okay. Ellen Lorraine was kind of pulled away from her desk. So, um, okay. but, but you know, I'll make sure that, that we go back and, and get all of the information that's been requested and um, look at the, you know, various scenarios. Okay. And when we do that, um, do we know for the city lot, the adjacent city lot, do we know what the usage is there? Because 
I would expect that it would be similar for spaces just next door to it. And honestly, that would probably be the best information to utilize yeah. in, in looking at, a, at, a hundred, at the occupancy rate and everything. Yeah. Uh, because although as you well, as you well identified for us last year, or earlier this year, uh, the signage on that lot is pretty obscure. Mm -hmm. uh, so how many people know about it uh, might drag the number lower than 50%, but we can certainly look at it. Okay. So that's, uh, you know, we, there's a lot more coordination to be done on this. The bank is still interested. Uh, and uh, Mr. O'Hare was very receptive to, uh, to uh, the discussion I had with him, uh, but we uh, obviously there's a lot more work to be done here. And I would caution you that uh, the, the estimates that Charlie provided are estimates as of this past spring. Uh, so we would have to rebid this if we were to go forward again. Well, I can check in with the two contractors because it, was, it wasn't bid, it was just um, an estimate. The, well, it was proposals because the city's portion was less than the $25,000 threshold, which is an important consideration. Right. Charlie, just one last question on this one. You, you had mentioned uh, M&T on the resurfacing portion. Like, what's the light? Is it at the lifespan anyway? Would they be looking to do that at this point of the, the age of the lot anyway? Yeah, I would say yes, Andrew. Yeah, because, you know, we look to seal coat paving 10 to 15 years out while it's still in good condition. And that's where we're at right now with the parking lot. So, yes. Thank you. Right. Well, anyway, I think um, there's more work to be done here. Unless there's other concern or discussion at this point, I think we could move on to the next item. Anyone else have anything they'd like to add? Can I just ask one more question? Sorry. Uh, sure. and, and I know there's always a problem in splitting any kind of, uh, of contract, but given that the other uh, bid came in so much lower for the portion for, uh, for um, uh, Hotel Rodney, is there, would there be any possibility of having them do the dumpster relocation work and having uh, the other bid uh, really do the repaving and all the other work? Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say no to that because uh, the prices might actually change because of the economies of scale. Plus, they might both just go having up. two contractors mm -hmm. out there, you know, you run into problems of you know, some pointing fingers at each other if something were to go wrong. I'd, I'd, I'd recommend not doing that. Okay. okay. All right. Well, I think it's a good discussion. There's some good questions raised here, uh, but hopefully everybody understands where we are and there is a limit to how much we would gain and there is a limited time, um, but we can continue working on this. So the next item on the agenda is uh, an update on the, uh, on the signage uh, project. Anne Marie, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so we had, um, gosh, I'm trying, time flies. Um, I think back at the end of May, we had a public session where um, Merge, um, I guess, showed their, their plan options. Um, then we had the election, and um, I've been trying to get a date to have Merge um, do a presentation to bring the, the new council people kind of up to speed on things. And I was just looking at my email. I last sent an email the beginning of September and asked if, if we could meet sometime in September. So I have not gotten a response to that. So I need to, to follow up, um, make sure it doesn't fall through the cracks. So the, the hope at this point would be to get a presentation during um, October so that we can bring the whole package back in November um, for council to act on. And then, then we can put together bid specifications um, and, and get the, the bid out to, to do the signage replacement prior to next parking season. Uh, we did, uh, we did a, a, a sign the contract to go ahead and design it though, correct, Anne-Marie? 
Oh yes, the, the design is, is most of the way done. Um, we just want to bring the, the new council people who hadn't been in the loop right. up to kind of where things are so that when this comes before council to vote that they you know, right. know, know what they're voting on. Does, I, does, for the benefit of Carolyn and, uh, and others perhaps who are on listening, uh, this was a, a proposal to come up with some signage that's consistent from Route 1 uh, into Rehoboth and into Lewis. Uh, and Rehoboth had gone through the design process last year and signed the contract this year to go forward with the installation of the signage of uh, designs. Um, and I believe that their proposal came in that they uh, agreed to came in around $200,000. Mayor, they've implemented a lot of those signs across Rehoboth. They're everywhere now. Thank you. So, uh, obviously, uh, our signage might be considerably smaller, but uh, what you would see is signage on Route 1 would have a consistent theme to uh, in Lewis, and but we would each have our own um, uh, logo or whatever we had selected uh, for identification purposes. Uh, so they they would each be unique. They wouldn't be Rehoboth wouldn't be the same as Lewis. So. Just a question on the the concept of that beyond aesthetics. What's the I guess the ROI for it? Well, better 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 uh, identif better directions for people, Andrew. Uh, helping people find things. Uh, Nancy did a great job last winter of showing us uh, how obscure our signage is, how uh, cluttered it is, uh, how inconsistent it is in styling and size and, and shape. And uh, so I think uh, that really is the benefit. Uh, not only uh, sign, I think we, we've identified it and we've spoken of it in terms of sign pollution uh, and if you, if you, Andrew, if you drive, it, it, it's an interesting exercise to do, and it's one I did, as, the, as this committee knows, uh, taking photos. If you drive into town and you imagine that you don't know where anything mm -hmm. is in Lewis and you're looking for a parking space, and you know you can make different turns and uh, imagine that you haven't found a parking space on Second Street, it, it's very confusing how to find something. So. Well. I think a big part of it was that there was going to be a significant number of signs that we could eliminate that are out, mm -hmm. out there now. Right. And this is not, you know, down to the, the signage is not down to um, really um, individual properties or things like that, but it would identify uh, significant places like parking and uh, how to get to city hall, how to get to, uh, you know, what I would call uh, significant things like, the overfalls and uh, things like that. So, okay. All right, uh, unless there's further questions, uh, that's a to be continued. Hopefully we can get uh, Merge to come and make a, a, give, provide us more information in the near future. Uh, moving on then to item C4 is an update and possible use of the BB parking lots on weekends. BB has been very receptive to this idea of using the parking lot, the at-grade parking lot at the end of Market Street, um, next to the building that they refer to as the Bob, um, which is the old nursing home for those of you who've been around. Uh, and uh, that is a that would be a no-charge lot uh, that we could identify as uh, a parking that would be available or additional parking that could be available. It does involve a, a walk uh, or some, or we look at what kind of transportation would we want to provide for people to get from that parking lot, which is essentially, uh, I will say, barely three blocks uh, from downtown. Uh, and uh, it, it is a walk through the historic district, um, you know, through the Market Street uh, corridor. Uh, and uh, it's something that we could do. Uh, I, I'm sure that on a, on a nice day when uh, there isn't raining and it isn't 100 degrees, people might walk, uh, but there are, there are some concerns about uh, the possibility of people not wanting to use it because of the distance. Uh, I don't know how you all feel about that, uh, what your thoughts are about what kind of reception might be. I know most of our customers like to park right outside the door, uh, but um, this is an option that would 
could provide some overflow parking on weekends, Saturdays and Sundays. I'm, I'm not sure that if we look at the Schley lot and other lots there, I believe they're currently underutilized. Um, I, I think that's accurate, but please chime in. Um, I'm not what I'm not sure about Ted, but I, I know you talked about it before is how much what is the distance between the BB lot compared to that to the Chalet lot? Is there a difference in walking time? Um, I don't think there is, but I I think we determined that it's pretty much the same. The advantage is you don't have to cross Savannah Road yep. or Highway. Agree uh, with that. So in terms of pedestrian safety, Fourth Street's a busy street. Uh, so you do have to cross that, but there yeah. uh, it is a four-way stop there, uh, and you're not dealing with uh, a state road, which is obviously Savannah Road and Kings Highway are both state roads, so they have much heavier traffic. I think where it could become interesting is if we think about, and I forget the company's name that Matt sourced from Annapolis, I think, mm -hmm. that was talking about... Uh, really a multimodal approach, but a big thrust of it was valet parking. If you were to pursue something with BB, it could be valuable if we move forward with that type of concept, I think, I don't know. But. I, I was gonna suggest that too, or maybe the use of bike, and maybe Chief Spell can comment on this, but the use of uh, bicycle jitneys or something like that, you know. I'm sure Chief would love that. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, again, this is a back to a, the earlier point about you don't have to cross Savannah Road. We can't forget that there are businesses on both sides of Savannah Road. Absolutely. Yep. Did not not overlooking that, Matt. Hey, Mayor. Not and just ours. Quick, There's uh, a lot of them. Dimension check on Google Earth, and it's roughly the same distance from, the, surprisingly, from Chalet to Second Street than it is from the BB lot to Second Street. A little bit more circuitous, but it's roughly the same distance. Right. I think in terms of pros and cons of each of them, and, and, and keep in mind, given if we can put our, our heads into a space when there was absolutely no, no parking in town because so many people were coming, um, in a sense, both of them potentially should be under consideration. Uh, so I'm not sure we should be talking about this as an either or. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the pros and cons, you know, Schley, uh, you're going through a more residential area to get to it. And I think uh, the, the residents along that route uh, would have some concerns. Uh, BB, uh, and, you, and you do have to cross Savannah, though there are businesses on both sides. Um, however, it feels like a, it, it's funny because when you look at it from uh, uh, from Google Earth, you can see it's the same distance. I have to say, psychologically, it feels like a shorter distance because you're not going on this circuitous uh, route where you're kind of walking through the BB parking lot and around the hospital, et cetera. So mm -hmm. it also feels, quite frankly, a little more pleasant as a route. But for either of them, I think that distance is something that we have to get people over, either with uh, with a valet kind of system, um, or with we've looked uh, when we looked a while ago, we looked at what other cities were doing to make the walk much more pleasant and interesting. And one could imagine doing some kind of a history walk uh, that took you from Schley to, to downtown with sites along the way. So you'd actually want to park in the lot. And you'd have to, we'd have to think about something similar for, uh, for BB. Right. The, the other thing that, I mean, again, we, we're not combining the, the parking committees, but if you operate a Jitney service, you could actually offer and have more predictable incomes by offering people a daily parking at say a Schley where in the day they're taking the Jitney down to the beach and in the evening they come, you know, mm -hmm. they hopefully you know, utilize the downtown for shopping or for eating. It's all possible. I, I think uh, you know both of these ops. Both of these options are viable, uh, and uh, some kind of means of helping people get there would be helpful. 
Uh, but it is an option that remains open to us to, for consideration as we look at how we want to go forward. Mara, just a question on the, the term weekends. Would that, because, you know, again, maybe Matt can comment on this. But I, I would imagine Friday, Thursday, Friday, particularly in the summer, are, are busier nights as well, right? Even more so than, say, Sunday, Friday, a Thursday and a Friday evening would probably be more busy in the summer, correct, than a... Uh, using it on a Sunday evening or could you comment on that? I mean, I, uh, in a, in a non COVID world, I think from, you know, July one to Labor Day, it's, it's pretty consistent all the way through the week. I mean, you, you do see Sunday probably is, I mean, I mean, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but maybe that's the, the lower day of, but the weekdays all kind of blend together in the summer. It just seems like we're kind of maxed out really. Mm -hmm. Right. So I don't know what BD's willingness, for example, would be to offer the same kind of hours they were talking about, where maybe from five to nine or something they, in, during the week, they could also offer rather than just the weekends. I think that's, a, that's a, an ask that can be made. I really do. Um, obviously the hospital uh, primarily, uh, you know, it, their, their main business hours are, you know, until five o'clock or so. So I think that's an ask that could be made. Well, I can pursue that with them. See what they I should have. also point out that, um, because of the work that's being done at the Lewis School, uh, the farmers market is using the uh, BB parking lot now. And it's interesting. We, we had the same issue that people thought it was going to be much further. And it was actually a slightly shorter walk than parking at, at the at, uh, 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 shields and, and walking in. Um, but uh, the positive side it, too of this is that it means a whole series of people have discovered that lot as a place to park. Yeah. And here again, it's temporary because eventually the, the, uh, the old nursing home will come down and uh, it's unclear as to what, how that space will actually be utilized. It might become more parking, it might become some other, uh, be otherwise utilized by the hospital. So this would be a temporary uh, solution. Mayor. I, I just want to provide an update. Um, I emailed John Bozio from Merge, and he got back to me quickly. He um, he misunderstood the, the last email, so he thought that that public session was going to be on October 12th. But he we can do that on October 16th at 2 in the afternoon, if that works. Um, and uh, again, the, the intent is really for um, Andrew and Tim, the new council people, but um, again, it's one more opportunity to, to make it available to the public and anybody else who wants to participate. Okay. That's a Friday at what time? Two. One thirty. Two. Two. Okay. I know that for business owners, that might be a difficult time to attend, but. Um, it, it would be, it would be preferable in the morning, but okay. um, I was at the last public hearing, Anne Marie. So I personally feel like I know I know what's going on. So don't schedule it around my schedule. <laughs> but how about everybody else? Anybody else have a conflict on this Friday the sixteenth? I mean, I I can mention early morning. Why don't we see if that works at all? And if it does, that'd be good. If not, okay. Okay, then moving on uh, to possible action uh, to increase the use of Schley Avenue. Uh, as you'll recall, the city uh, identified Schley Avenue as a satellite parking area. And uh, we went in and uh, created parking spaces there. Uh, on a gravel lot, uh, it has become, uh, you know, utilized. It, is, it has never really been utilized well by downtown uh, people, I don't believe, but it's been used by some people um, to, for I think some business owners have parked there, and I know the city has parked vehicles there. Uh, what we have also heard from the neighbors who live over there is that the Schley Avenue or Franklin Avenue access to the trail has become a very popular way for people to get off the trail and get into downtown because they don't feel safe on Gills Neck Road. Uh, so that location 
uh, is already being identified by bikers and perhaps walkers as a way to get into town, which is consistent with, uh, so it, it is, a, although it's a circuitous route, as Nancy mentioned, uh, it's not something that is alien to people. But I think what we found is that uh, it's just never been utilized. At the same time, I didn't put it on this agenda, but we did the same thing with the Otis Smith lot uh, next to the Daily Market, between the Daily Market and the Beacon. And in fact, both of these sites have EV charging stations um, for, and uh, I do see vehicles being charged at both of these sites from time to time. Um, but neither of these two locations have ever really been picked up and utilized to their full extent. Uh, so we need to look at how can we uh, better increase utilization. Is it just, a, is it a jitney or is it some, some other way, a better signage? There is signage on King's Highway directing people to go up Franklin and find the parking. But one of the things we had talked about in the budget cycle this year was doing some landscaping to try and make that parking lot more attractive uh, for utilization because it's, it really just looks like you know, a gravel lot at this point. There's no parking. Uh, there's really not much there to entice people. And then with the uh, construction laydown that's been going on, uh, it's seemingly uh, not as desirable, but open for discussion. I, th I think you just nailed it there, uh, Mayor, is that I think just it, it looks like an industrial zone there. So I think it's basically deter. I think some people ride up there and assume that it's employee parking for BPW or, or what have you and don't see it as a, a place for public. So I think even for the benefit of the trail users, it might be, you know, beautification, I think, is probably necessary over there, at least organization. <laughs> Yeah, we are in active discussion with the BPW about how we can beautify or how we can reconfigure that lot um, and try to make it uh, more attractive. Uh, one of the things that has been discussed is uh, the possibility of rotating the lot so that it would front, uh, you would enter off of a Schley and then it would run back to the trail rather than running up Schley, uh, getting some of the traffic um, to come in that way rather than coming off of Franklin. Uh, so there's an active discussion there, but I think, you know, beautification and some signage uh, is going to be a key to getting that picked up. Betsy, do you want to comment on uh, what's going on in terms of, I know you were going to use it for uh, events and encourage vendors and things like that, which. Uh... That's true. Um, it is utilized when we have uh, events here in Guanadale Park. Uh, the garden tour is a, a good example of it. And um, People come in to buy their tickets and they say, where can we park? And we direct them down there. So it's definitely used for overflow parking uh, when we have a lot of people in town. Um, my experience is what I have been told by people, um, visitors that are coming here that know nothing about where to park. They, they see the sign right outside the visitor center by our 30-minute um, parking that says um, free public parking and directs people down Franklin, but what they say is they get down Franklin and they don't know where the public parking is. They see the city lot, uh, the police department lot, they see the, the Presbyterian church parking lot, and they go, well, where's, you know, they don't know that they have to go all the way down. So I think that issue will be addressed uh, with, with the merge uh, signage, I would, I would hope. Um, and I just, I saw something in the chat about Presbyterian church, just for those people that don't know, we were asked um, not to direct people to park in that parking lot. Specifically, we're told not to. Um, in prior years, <clears throat> excuse me, we did have permission, like the day of the garden tour, to let the vendors park there. But a couple of years ago, um, they notified us that they did not want us to identify that as a public parking place because they have a lot of um, uh, groups, or if they have in the past had a lot of groups that utilize that parking lot. And uh, if they have a funeral, which is you know, obviously not scheduled in advance uh, or weddings and that sort of thing. So, so we do not have that um, on our uh, literature uh, as a possible parking place. And we, we've been told not to uh, tell people that that's a possibility. Right, thanks, Betsy. Any other comments about 
Schley or any comments about the Otis Smith law. Uh, I, again, uh, do not see that being utilized, um, perhaps being utilized by Pig and Publican and uh, patrons as well as perhaps the, uh, the, uh, the steakhouse, but I, I don't see it being utilized on a regular basis. But I think, again, some signage would be helpful. I think that's another one where it gets tricky because, you know, it's, it's right up against the, the private property and people don't necessarily, I mean, they ticket and tow or whatever in the, in the private lot there. Right. So I think that people are almost a little scared of that area because it's not clear what's public and what's part of the, Correct. the commercial. Right. I do have an update on the wayfinding. We can do the morning of October 19th at 8.30. That's Monday the 19th at 8.30? Yep. Does that work for everybody? Yes. Okay, let's go with that then. That suits you, Andrew? Yeah, I can make it work. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I have a question about the BB lot that I I'm, apologize I didn't ask, but I just thought of. One of the issues uh, that came forward uh, with the parking committee uh, via Nancy, who was charged with understanding the residential impacts of our lack of parking was that uh, residents on Mulberry Market, as well as Third, the parking situation in a normal year can become pretty untenable. Um, where they residents can't even park within three blocks of their home or they feel they can't go to the pharmacy because they have no, you know, no place to come back or whatever. Do we think that accessing the BB lot as a city parking lot and promoting that could help also alleviate the residential parking problem more so than Schley? I don't know. I'm, I'm at sort of wondering myself. Um, I live on the other side of town, so I'm not as familiar with the distances there. Um. I don't know. So, Derek, I don't. I you bring up a great point, and I've been thinking about this as well because we got, as you all remember, we got a ton of feedback in in the later meetings from the residents, and I really think that this problem we should use the issues that those residents have as our main driver to, to try to solve this problem. Because I think if we can solve that problem, then we're going to create benefits for the parking in the business community. And I, I, one thing I was going to say was that it would be great to get a lot of those residents back on these meetings because I feel like they gave us a lot of really good information and it's good to hear, you know, their challenges on a regular basis to try to help. I really think if we focus on the residential parking issue, meaning those um, downtown streets, that will help us come up with the grander, bigger solution that needs to take place to, to solve the, the business parking issue as well. I think the challenge is, is, is a big one, okay? And uh, yeah, the challenge that we have with all of these solutions is getting people to walk three blocks. Mm -hmm. Because when you, you know, speaking to the residents on uh, Market and Mulberry, um, you know, one of their problems, it's, it's not just uh, people uh, parking to go to businesses in, in Lewis. It's people parking there from, uh, to go to the hospital. Mm -hmm. So we're talking, you know, we're talking about people parking on adjacent residential streets when there's uh, parking available right next to the hospital, but on the other side of it. Right. And um, that was one of their concerns, as well as the issue of uh, whether we were going to define uh, parking spaces, which is, I know, on, on the agenda later this morning. Okay. Yeah, one of the things that you're gonna see change also is the hospital with their opening of their surgery hospital out on 24. There's a lot of hospital activity that's going to um, be, it won't be as intense probably uh, because uh, things that are going to be considered as uh, things, uh, surgeries and things that can be done on an outpatient basis will be done over on 24 going forward. So hip replacements, knee replacements, things like that will travel over to 24. So as that surgery center opens or that uh, hospital opens over there, it's going to change some of the uh, demand for, uh, for parking for the hospital, I would imagine. 
that the full impact of that is obviously unknown. So, but I noticed uh, Steve Hansel or perhaps uh, Ann Hansel is on the is on the attendee list, and uh, I obviously there uh, Steve and Ann are residents of Third Street, and Ann did speak up uh, and brought us some ideas. Uh, and if I would invite uh, a comment from them if they would care to do so. either type it into the chat or a Q&A, or we can, um, we can elevate you if you wanna speak. All right. Well, it doesn't look like that's gonna to work today. So we could move on then to discussing the hours of operation. Steve. So Steve. Okay, I see you, uh, Steve, Ann, if you wanna speak. Just have to unmute yourself. Hi, good morning, everybody. Morning. Morning. Um, I guess this is directed uh, more towards Matt and uh, Derica. Our observation, uh, particularly this summer, but also throughout the year, is that, that the parking, um, all day parking on West Third, and we're, we're, for us, it's between Mulberry and Park, um, there's a lot of all day parking by uh, em employees with the businesses and restaurants downtown. What, and, and, and nothing has really changed now. What, um, I think it was Don, I forget Don's last name. He was, I think, on the bicycle commission. He may head that up. He Don made, yes, he made a suggestion that, that Third Street, west of Park, towards Burton, and he calculated the number of uh, available parking spots there, and it was quite significant. Um, but there's no signage there to indicate to, to residents or visitors that that's usable for all day parking. Mm -hmm. So it, it seems to me that would be an easy way to kind of shift people away from the residential section of West Third where we are a little bit farther out. So it's, an, it's, it's in addition to, you know, BB or Schley. It's just, there are spaces that people just don't seem to know about. Good point. Any, any thoughts, Matt or, or uh, Derica? I mean, I, I think you're bringing up a good point. It comes up every time. And, you know, I know at least from what I'm hearing from my business colleagues, and I will say I have parking as part of my lease. So my employees are not parking on the street, but they're telling their employees not to take up parking and then to park further away. I, I don't know beyond that um, what we can do without rule. I mean, I think if it's being violated, we need some type of mechanism to keep people from doing that. Um, I don't know what those <laughs> that, that solution is. Um, the other thing them. I would say is, and I don't know, but do you know for sure it's employees parking all day or is it the rentals and the VRBOs that have four and five bedrooms that have three and four SUVs coming to rent for the week? I, I don't, I think there's a mix of both from what I'm seeing. Um, but I, I don't know for sure. Because we see them coming and going. Yeah, it's We actually see the coming and going and can pretty yeah. much recognize them. Uh, gotcha. I'm, I'm going to say primarily as restaurant workers, but it, it could be um, just employees of the different uh, businesses. Um, and they, they sometimes come at a certain time in the morning and they're here all day and they leave. So it, we recognize the properties nearby that, that, that are rentals or uh, <coughs> Airbnbs. And I don't think that's the case. Okay. It may be to a certain extent, I agree with you, but it's, it's not the dominant uh, parking. Yeah. yeah I think the, it, the, the challenge for the business owner, as you can imagine, especially a restaurant uh, that has met more employees than I do in retail, for example, how do you police, you know, who's driving what car and you know what I mean? Like it's, um, 
And I agree. And as a resident, how do we police it? Right. It's, I, yes. It's, I, I'm, it's public parking. <laughs> yeah. No, I agree. I, I'm empathizing and I, I, I don't know the solution, but I know it's a problem. Yeah. I, I think yeah. there, I think there are ways of policing it. Um, but they take out, it, it takes effort and it would take effort, uh, by our police and it would take effort by the businesses. Um, so I, and I have to go back and look at what, what city it was that basically had their, uh, the employees, uh, were directed to park at a lot like Schley and, um, uh, you know, were getting a, a parking ticket stamped by their employer every day. And when you have employees who show up, who you know drive to work, um, and they're not doing that, you pretty much know probably where they're parking. Um, who manages and, the stamping? The police, Nancy? Well, it, it, it would be. It would be. I mean, this this is the part that the onus would be on the employer to do to do that stamping, and then residents can report cars that are repeatedly parking all day. And you can run the license, the police can run the license plate on it and know who the owner is. Um, but, you know, that's a lot of policing. And I don't think we've really put in um, the, a, a concerted effort to try to get the employees to park in these other lots. Um, and I should say, each time this comes up, we also come back to the issue of... Uh, people, uh, 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 restaurant workers who, who, clo who help close up, having to walk a distance uh, to a lot that is kind of, you know, it's kind of dark and it's kind of lonely back at Sh uh, in the Schley lot, you know, at 11 or 12 p.m. Um, so I know I'm stating the problem more than the solutions yeah. here but it's clearly a persistent problem. And I've, I've even spoken to people who I see parking every day. And I, I, you see, I, know, who, I know what restaurant they work at even. You know, I mean, you, you kind of get to know people, so. So I can, um, I mean, we talk about this regularly, obviously, and, and we do have parking for most of our staff, but I can do, you know, basically run an internal survey and try and find out where the spots are that they are using to get a little bit more, you know, educated on, and then, and then try to, you know, use that as a result and try to redirect them to these other lots. But then to you, a big, a big challenge is closing at night and people having to walk far distances to, and I realize it's that the other thing is it's not, it's all these streets. If if we start pushing them away from one street, we're going to start pushing them into other streets. And I, I think that it just compounds onto itself. And, you know, we've discussed that too. Like if you push, you know, a lot of residents had a problem when we push meters out a little bit further because then those free spots become free spots on their street. And, you know, that all of these things all kind of come under one huge problem, I think. And we need to, you know, think about, bigger answers, which I've been saying forever, is we need more inventory. And how can we get more inventory? If we had more inventory, it could hopefully relieve a lot of this residential pressure. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, the inventory we have, like Schley and like BB, isn't being used. Right. So I always say practical is, inventory. We can't, you know, we can't have multi, you know, we can't have, uh, you know, like things in New York City, you know, that are uh, kind of the elevator things for cars for every spot along Second Street because people would prefer the spot that's right in front of where they're going. Yeah. You know? Right. Exactly. Okay. Well, something, something else could be considered is creating year round resident parking spots and then associated tags that, you know, that ha hanger on their mirror or something that indicates that they, that's their year round spot. I mean, you could consider that. Okay. We had, just so you know, Andrew, we had a long discussion about this uh, uh, a year, a year and a half ago, I guess it was. And um, it, it's very interesting. Residents are very split on this uh, option. And, you know, we have one street that's very, very keen on it. And I got a lot of feedback from other residents 
that they did not want to go that direction. Okay. So, and why, Nancy, more. can you refresh us why they didn't want to go in that direction? Um, they, they felt that, uh, that, that there's a burden on them uh, to get this. They were then going to have to, in some way, pay over time. The move would be to have them pay to have this tag. They have multiple vehicles um, and people who uh, have second homes here, but are, you know, uh, summertime residents. And many of those people are now, are now full-time residents here. Um, drive different cars. Uh, they, they felt that, I think many residents felt that if we could tackle the solution of getting uh, the restaurant workers and others who park full time and move them uh, to Shay or to uh, Booby that you wouldn't have this problem. So, I I really I don't know the solution either, but I feel like just communicating with your employees is not going to solve this issue. No, not at all. Um, if you just look at average turnover in the restaurant industry alone, I mean I'm just saying. Just say you have a 20% turnover in staff per year. How are you going to keep up communicating with all those new people all the time? I feel like we need, we need a, a hardened solution. I don't know the answer. It's complicated. But I also feel, I, I personally feel a responsibility that we have to focus on the residential issue this year. Um, it's... I mean, in some ways, you could even argue it becomes a hazard if you can't get out of your house to get, I mean, worst case scenario, there's an emergency, I don't know, or you need to go to the doctor, the pharmacy, whatever. Um, anyway, I just want to say I hope that we make this a priority this year, and I know it's hard. Yeah, this is a really good discussion. Unfortunately, um, Andrew and Anne Marie and I have a, a council executive session that begins in about seven minutes. Uh, I think we're going to have to probably stop the, the uh, work on this agenda. And probably it's a good point to stop because uh, I, Ellen Moraine, uh, based on the conversation about uh, revenue and projection of costs for uh, what it would cost, try to recover the cost and occupancy rate, uh, we, we can pick this up. Uh, what I would suggest is that we, I don't want to stifle this conversation, but given the fact we have this other meeting already scheduled, we, we need to stop. Can we allow enough time on the 19th, or excuse me, the, you know, the 19th when we meet uh, to continue this discussion and by then we'll have more information uh, about that and hopefully um, we'll have more information. We will have spoken further with uh, Mr. O'Hare and, uh, and Larry Pfeiffer about what possibilities might be uh, may be workable as far from their perspective. Um, I'm sorry to uh, cut this meeting short, but we've been at it almost an hour and a half. And may, may I, can I make a, I just want to bring up an idea for the for sure. future. Okay. Is maybe dividing up, because there is a lot to tackle here, is maybe dividing up into subcommittees where a group of, of us look at residential issues, a group of us look at satellite parking. That way when we come to meetings like this, there's a knowledge base of um, having gotten an opportunity to speak to the residents around those areas, done some research and how it works more effectively in other towns, et cetera, rather than say all 12 or 10 of us kind of tackling the, the broad problem. Okay. That's just an idea. I mean, okay. Andrew, I also, th I think on top of that too, you know, th there's the beach parking committee too. And I, I feel like that, our two committees ought to have joint meetings at some point because I think that the the issues do relate and there could be benefit from sort of existing together and sharing thoughts on the overall, you know, hopefully success of the problem. Matt, that is anticipated that we would, uh, as we work on this end, we would eventually have a joint meeting or many uh, to look at what could be worked together. That that was already discussed and, and, and is a plan. So yes, I think it's a great idea because the solution really is uh, twofold. So, all right. So do we want to put on the next agenda to um, break into subcommittees? To I think we'll put it on the agenda to break into subcommittees at the next agenda. So everybody gets some thought as to what they would like to do uh, in terms of what, what aspect of this 
situation or challenge that we're talking about, you would like to uh, get involved with and we'll divide it up and go forward from there. Okay. Again, I'm very sorry to have to cut this meeting short. I think it was a meaningful discussion and I think we're at least everybody's on the same page on most topics and it'll be helpful to have the merge information at the next meeting. So thank you all for taking time to be here this morning and uh, have a good weekend. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.